Hello, everybody. Welcome back to uh, the final panel, closing panel of this uh, conference, evidence-based policymaking, um, a collaborative event of free for eis and CU. Um, we've heard a number of highly relevant uh, presentations this afternoon, highly relevant for policymaking. Um, and I want to thank again all the presenters. Um, the intention of this concluding panel is to bring these detailed research results into a broader picture and to discuss issues concerning the linkages between scientific evidence, policymaking, and institutions. As we all know, the corona pandemic has highlighted the importance of scientific research, not only in the area of the life sciences, but in particular, I think, also in the social sciences and in economics. Our lives radically changed due to the political measures introduced to curb the epidemic and to know which measures actually worked and which did not or not so well. Scientific evidence was instrumental. So we want to use this uh, panel to reflect on what it takes to provide scientific evidence. What is required to adequately advise and inform policymakers about scientific evidence in questions that are of, often also time critical and sometimes publicly contested. What are the prerequisites to provide scientific evidence in a manner that is useful for policymakers, yet at the same time in line with rigorous standards of scientific conduct? To discuss these issues and related issues, we have assembled a panel of highly uh, distinguished contrib contributors. And um, one, I think, one of the things that um, really uh, make this panel very interesting is that they that they are experts with uh, very different perspectives from where they work from. Um, people from research and academia as well as uh, from policymaking. Uh, but before we turn to our panel and to, to, to this discussion, let me first hand over to the rapporteurs from the three breakout sessions as they will briefly summarize the presentations and the discussions there. First, I want to start with Josef Baumgartner, senior researcher at the VIFO, and uh, he was uh, he's a rapporteur from the panel Global Crises and Policy Response. Josef. Yeah, thank you very much. The first session uh, was the main topic was on empirical macroeconomics, and we discussed uh, more, uh, three papers uh, on uh, now casting uh, economic activity, forecasting, and also. A policy sim simulation models and agent-based uh, policy simulation model. And uh, to conclude the, the overall um, impact uh, on, the, on the presentations, uh, I think the, the main conclusion is data. Yeah? So we need urgent data to now cast the, uh, well, the, the economic effect of an ongoing crisis. And this was very urgent in the very beginning. And so we had to establish new data sources that we could uh, address these uh, uh, questions and issues. Uh, so we were all, almost in an avalanche and predicting how long and how big is this avalanche. And so we needed new data for that. Uh, and this is the now casting aspect that was raised in the presentation uh, by Sebastian uh, Koch from the Institute for Advanced Studies. And also then to um, forecast the overall impact on economic growth for uh, the, the, the overall for the, for, the, for the whole year. And this was more the, the, um, the perspective, the focus on the third presentation on a um, uh, um, forecasting model, a cluster model uh, presented by Christian Glocker from the Austrian Institute of Economic Research. And these two uh, presentations, I, can, I think we can summarize in that point from an evidence-based policy making perspective so that the most needed thing is uh, urgent, data and so we had to um, to focus or to, to find new sources because the administrative uh, statistics uh, because of uh, quality requirements and all the uh, data collecting processes takes much longer 
then this uh, data are available. So we had to stick to other sources like uh, financial institutions to have uh, uh, information on credit card uh, um, uh, revenues and and uh, and on also other uh, mobility data from from mobile uh, phone uh, companies and all these data we had to collect in a very short time and we had no really uh, information or uh, experience with this kind of data when we started these projects and yeah so and the next uh, uh, presentation was an agent based model uh, and here also uh, the the main point uh, that was raised for the use for uh, evidence based policy making is you need a disaggregated heter uh, heterogeneous database to uh, simulate ex ante uh, effects on uh, the household household income or uh, distribution or also on the firm distributions how are small or large firms uh, influenced by uh, various policy measures or export oriented various uh, uh, the uh, internal market uh, oriented firms so the main point to conclude my few minutes for for this uh, uh, statement data we need data and and uh, <laughs> and 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 uh, a more uh, especially disaggregated uh, administrative data. So, yeah, so far, thank you. Thank you, Josef. Um, let's see if the other panels come to a similar conclusion. Uh, Victoria Poldoratskaya from the CU is the rapporteur for the second panel, Data-Driven Policymaking, where it's already in the title. Let's see. Hello, everyone. Um, we had a very interesting discussion on our panel, and I would probably split it into two parts. So first of all, we discussed which data do we need, and then we started discussing how exactly do we need to use this data. Um, so the first presentation was given by Mihaly Fazekas, and we discussed um, basically how it is important to zoom in the data that we have on government procurement. Um, and by showing us uh, the model that was created uh, in order to predict the prices um, and uh, also estimate on, on the level of certain projects, um, what is the uh, correlation, for instance, between the number of bidders and uh, uh, the prices for certain projects. Um, it was obvious that from, from it, it was obvious that actually the descriptive statistics is something that is very, very important when we talk about policymaking and showing the data to policymakers, um, as well as the disaggregated data. And basically to the same conclusion came the second presenter, um, Julia Bachtrugel Unger. So on the example of, um, of data on the project supported by Horizon 2020 and uh, ERDF uh, on research and innovation funding. Um, she showed that basically, if again, we disaggregate the data, we can get to the information on which projects, for instance, are mostly supported, which projects are less supported. And it's way more informative than just to look at the aggregated level data on the um, country level, for instance. Um, also, that would be very interesting to explore this further and, for instance, to get to the understanding of why different regions have received different amount of support and how it is correlated with the level of their economic development, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then we came to the discussion, which was really insightful, I think, um, on what is the um, relationship between expertise and emotions. And actually, when we talk about data, it's such a rational approach that we try to convince people that something is very important and we need to do this and that. And we also try to convince policymakers by showing them the rational perspective of why it is needed. 
Um, while actually the emotions are completely out of this picture. And sometimes it leads to the situation of polarization within society when the policymakers try to, um, to provide some policies, while it is definitely against what people feel and what do they actually think about it and what their well-being, etc. So I think that, um, yeah, we also discussed that whether we need to draw the boundaries of where the emotions are more important if we go from one policy area to another policy area mm -hmm. and came to the conclusion that probably we just... Um, we get used to think about certain areas as more emotional ones, while actually this is probably not the case. And we need to uh, take into consideration the context of um, whom the data was provided to, who was the data collector, and um, uh, what is exactly the social context of uh, a certain situation that needs changes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victoria. And uh, I hand over to the third rapporteur, Susanne Forsta from the Institute for Joint Studies. Uh, the panel she will report from is uh, labor markets and institutions. Susanne. <clears throat> All right, um, thank you. And let me apologize again to everyone who was involved in our session that not everything worked so well. We had a bit shorter presentations, uh, but I think we still had enough time to get very a good overview of the three topics that were covered. We had three presentations, the first, all of them starting from um, empirical facts on labor markets. Um, the first one in Germany, in Germany and the second one um, in all, uh, the second and the third one in Austria, Monika Merz from the University of Vienna <coughs> talked about um, how basically they started from uh, empirical observations. She and her co-authors start from the empirical observation that there is a lot of heterogeneity of how couples, married couples, cohabitating couples, uh, locate their time choices for spouses between market work, homework and leisure. They go into starting from this, they're motivated to build a structural model of uh, non-cooperative households that non-cooperatively optimally decide how to allocate their time to different activities. They also go into Bayesian estimation of this model and in the end end up with a very, a very big and powerful tool for analysis of how um, aggregate wage elasticities of households that we use, uh, uh, so the elasticity of households or uh, participants in households, their hours elasticity with respect to the wage, how we think about these and how we estimate those from data and in a structural model with or without heterogeneity, how this actually affects the aggregate um, elasticities that we typically use also for, uh, in the end, for policy analysis. Um, Andrea Weber, uh, presented um, a study on uh, the question how temporary layoff and hiring expectations of um, unemployed affect the search and behavior, uh, search behavior and the outcomes um, of those unemployed, basically exploiting the particularity of the Austrian labor market where there are a lot of temporary layoffs because of seasonality of the sectors or particular sectors. And she compares, she and her co-author, they compare mm -hmm. um, labor market performance and also job search behavior between people who are laid off temporarily with some expectations of recall and with people who are laid off um, permanently. Um, how they, first of all, how, what, what the behavior in, in job search is, but also how they fare in the labor market um, later on. Um, and finally, Helmut Maringer from VIFO with his co-authors um, um, did an evaluation study of a pilot implementation of a new strategy of the public employment uh, services in Austria called IMS. Um, a new strategy for counseling and support for unemployed with multiple placement obstacles. So we're thinking of people who have been unemployed for for some longer term, I think uh, it was more than two years at least, and who have additional obstacles when trying to find employment again. And they exploit um, 
the particular design of how the pilot programs were um, were uh, introduced in various um, Arbeitsmarkt, Bezirke, Labor Market um, districts. Um, and in the end, for the short term, didn't find any clear positive impacts yet, but the long-term uh, impacts of this, this policy change or strategy change is still something that has to be um, evaluated later on. Okay. Thank you, Susanne. Um, yeah, I think uh, lots of food for thought, lots of food, food for discussion. Um, but I would like to turn right away to our distinguished panel, um, also due to time restrictions. And to start with, I would like to ask each one of you to give a brief introductory remark on the topic of this uh, conference, evidence-based policymaking, from your perspective. As I said, um, you all come from a very different perspective, and so I think it is very interesting to hear your initial remarks, and then I will follow up, and uh, maybe also some people in the audience will have some uh, questions, but I certainly have some questions for you. Um, to start with, I, I should say that uh, one of our panelists uh, is uh, unfortunately sick, Christina Tulena, uh, so she cannot be here today. We wish her all the best and a quick recovery. So I'll start uh, with our virtual guest here, Martin Kocher, the federal minister in, Aust in the Austrian Ministry of Labor, um, formerly also director at the Institute for Advanced Studies and my boss. Uh, from a prestigious university position to being director of a somewhat underfunded yet highly public non-university research institute to becoming minister of labor during an ongoing health crisis. From this perspective, Martin, it appears as if you've gone through a crash course of what evidence-based policymaking could should, would achieve. So I'm very curious to hear your statement, please. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Thomas. I hope you can hear me. Uh, I'm very sorry uh, for not being uh, present uh, uh, in Vienna. I'm just in Brussels for meetings with uh, commissioners and, uh, uh, and I'm uh, thankful that I'm able to participate virtually. Um, uh, um, good afternoon to everybody. Good afternoon, also the panel, Barbara, uh, Thomas, and uh, Tobias. Um, it's a bit weird to start as, as the politician. Uh, I think uh, usually it's the other way around that the scientists are and then the politicians uh, uh, defend uh, their stance uh, in favor against uh, uh, evidence-based policymaking. I'll try to, uh, to be brief. Um, so, I mean, I don't... I, I think I don't have to, to say that, that evidence-based policymaking, uh, in my view, is a very uh, relevant uh, concept, and I guess almost anybody would uh, agree that the crisis uh, in Austria was an accelerator. Uh, the pandemic was an accelerator of uh, evidence policy uh, making, evidence-based policy making. Why do I think uh, was it uh, that way? If the problems are really pressing and if there is uh, uh, not enough general evidence and probably also not enough uh, um, uh, positioning of political parties, politicians, uh, then, of course, uh, politics has to draw on evidence uh, and uh, has to draw on uh, um, very quick, uh, quickly available evidence. Um, and then the question is, is that evidence available and how is uh, the process organized? And uh, we have seen in Austria, and I'm sure that uh, Thomas is going to talk about that in more, in more detail, we have seen that there are some informal uh, institutions that... Uh, uh, that are quite active in, uh, uh, in, uh, in counseling and in, in advice giving to policy uh, from science. Um, but there is fewer formal uh, uh, institutions and the formal institutions are, were probably not all apt to the uh, challenge of the pandemic. So uh, that's a very interesting point. So the informal uh, institutions have, of course, uh, the advantage that they are quick. Um, but uh, sometimes, of course, um, the, the informal institutions, of, of, of course, have the advantage of being quick, uh, but uh, they sometimes lack, of course, uh, uh, the responsibilities, they lack uh, institutional arrangements, they sometimes lack other uh, important issues. Um, I, I want to very briefly, uh, one minute, talk about the incentive landscape that uh, uh, evidence-based policymaking has to bear in mind. Uh, and I, 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 it becomes more and more apparent as a politician how different incentives sometimes are between the different players. And that's uh, uh, not only the scientists and the politicians, it's also, of course, the media and the public, uh, uh, the public attention, the public uh, uh, 
uh, reception of things. First of all, the objectives are sometimes very different uh, between those uh, different groups. Uh, second of all, that's probably the most important issue in many practical uh, problems, the time frame. Uh, uh, politics, uh, uh, policy decisions are taken in very uh, short amounts of time, have to take quickly, whereas the scientists, of course, have a very different time frame um, in, in, in what, they are, uh, what they are operating in. Uh, the open-endedness of uh, the results, of course, uh, uh, many questions uh, that are asked in politics uh, are open-ended, but not fully open-ended, uh, in a sense, uh, because there are some polit political um, positioning going on, there's some political positioning going on uh, that, uh, uh, that is difficult to change after uh, some uh, evidence uh, uh, that comes, uh, comes about. This is a, a huge difference, I think, between politics and, uh, and science. And then there's, of course, responsibilities. I think that's a very important point to always bear in mind. I always, uh, even as a scientist, was uh, in favor of a clear uh, division of labor, uh, evidence provision by science, decision-making by uh, politicians. But of course, that's not always uh, fully implemented also in formal institutions. There are formal institutions uh, where there's a mixture of politicians and scientists or members of the administrations and scientists and it's more than just providing evidence. It's already policy making by scientists or by uh, people uh, uh, in the realm of politics. So I think that's uh, that's one of the issues that uh, I think makes uh, life for both sides sometimes difficult. And uh, we could go on like that. I'd probably stop here and uh, I'm looking forward to discussion. Thanks. Thank you, Martin. Um, Martin will have to leave at 6 p.m., so that was one of the reasons why I put you up first, um, which is not to indicate that I expect the others to talk too long now, but uh, <laughs> you know you have substantial things to say. Next up is Barbara Beinsack. Um, Barbara is professor and head of the Department of Political Science at the University of Vienna. Um, and you're not only a political scientist in the field of comparative politics, uh, you are also a specialist in the area of medicine and health policy, and you've long been working abroad in the UK in particular. So I think it's fair to say that not only by profession, but also by, um, by your experience, uh, you're a keen observer of different systems of science and policy interactions in one of the most sensitive areas, but also one of the areas that has become very prominent in the past uh, 14 months. So, very much looking forward to the comments. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Also from me, I think you can all hear me now. Um, I would like, well, I should first say that I listened to um, the talks today with great interest and benefit. Nevertheless, I would like to go against the assumption that seems to underpin some of our discussions today that data is this neutral thing that represents the world. So I think, and maybe you're not so surprised to hear this from somebody at the political science department, but data are really very political. They are political in the sense that they do not only represent what goes on in the world, but it also changes. So the, the, the very process of datafication changes certain things. I think we know that from personal experience. Those of us who use step counts, I'm sure you've had the same experience that you think, oh, I'm still below 10,000. I'm going to go for another walk or run. But it's also true in the large scale. So um, just recently with vaccinations, the fact that there are social deprivation indices around I made some states in the U.S. now use them to, prior to, to, to influence their priority decisions for vaccination because they realized that um, people who are socially and economically deprived already have a worse health status and they might, there might be a moral reason for uh, prioritization. But the point here is that data is not just something that is there, that is neutral, that represents the world, but data um, as, as, um, as other people have beautifully put it, they represent and intervene and of course, um, for anyone who has any contact with political science so far, um, James Scott's um, seminal work, Seeing Like a State, describes how the process of datafication makes things legible and makes people legible. So whether we datafy something or not is, is a process that says something about the social worth 
and the economic worth. You all know the, the, the saying that what's not countable doesn't count. It goes for GDP, but it goes also for other things. So that's one thing. And not only data are political, but also models are. So I think the obsession in the global, war, in the global north with modeling um, in the context of the pandemic, well, I should not put this so negatively, the focus on modeling, which has brought us wonderful things, has also um, made us in the global north neglect some of the high touch solutions. So because we were just focusing on what we could model, we were maybe not really looking at what, for example, people in Brazilian favelas did, where they had community um, organizers go from door to door and talk to people and debunk fake news and to prevent the spread of, um, of, of the virus with, with high, high touch and not only high tech means. This is, of course, not to say that, okay, we shouldn't have collected data, we shouldn't have modeled, not at all, because I think modeling also could be an opportunity to see, and some of the discussions today here have drawn attention to that. We could also look at what we actually don't have, the data that are missing, the people that are missing, and the data that are missing. So for example, a famous example, the NHS um, has given people inflated risk scores simply because they imputed data for where they were not there. Um, we have not in this country collected symptoms of uh, people who have been infected with COVID. The United Kingdom has. We have very little idea of how long COVID um, is materializing and how, whom it affects and what it does. It's a totally missed opportunity. Antibody surveillance and so on and so on. Um, finally, I think one of the things that ha I've already heard in the beginning of this, con of this um, afternoon today is that there's this conflation between data of data with everything that's there already quantified and already computable. And we really also need qualitative data. So to give you one example, you, you may have heard in Austria, you know, there was a, a moral panic around, around low vaccination um, not only low vaccination rates, but low willingness of people to get vaccinated. Uh, people said only 30, some surveys said only 30% will get vaccinated. So we did the quant surveys in the corona panel, but we also did qualitative surveys. And some of the people who said, I'm not going to get vaccinated, when we asked them why, which you can do in a qualitative study, they said, because I shouldn't get the vaccine, other people need it first. So it means we need quantitative and qualitative data. It's not data is not only what's already there and quantified and computable. Um, the final, final point: some of the structures that have now been built, new researchers collaborating, multidisciplinary um, collaborations. This has now sprung up during the pandemic, and this needs to be able to root um and be be funded and and properly supported for this for for these initiatives to take root and to grow so um we have fantastic things around data we have created them during the pandemic but now we need to make them sustainable thank you barbara um what you said on data reminds me of what the, the imminent public health scientist michael marmot once did with the, the title of this conference, he changed two words and he spoke of policy-based evidence making. Um, and it, he meant it very seriously. And I think it's a very good uh, concept to think about. So anyways, talk about uh, data, which brings us of course immediately to our next speaker, uh, Tobias Thomas, who is the Director General of the Statistics Austria and also Professor at the University of Düsseldorf. You are a trained economist and now you have the most important data provider for scientific research, but not only for scientific research, of course, also for policy making and for ad other administrative purposes. Um, and uh, from this perspective, uh, I would be very interested to hear what uh, what you have to say. On the topic of yeah, thank you, Mr. König, for this very friendly introduction and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Yeah, I'm very pleased and grateful for being invited here to this event. Uh, 
thank you to the organizers actually and i'm in particularly happy because uh, the topics which we are discussing today are touching me from several perspectives actually you mentioned already that i'm professor of economics in dusseldorf so i'm a scientist by myself uh, in addition my main job is today to manage statistics austria so the national statistical institute so the representative of official statistics in austria um, from my perspective actually in his work Welcome note, uh, President Ignatiev brought it very much to the point. We are facing indeed data revolution, the data landscape gets more complex, and this has, of course, impact on social scientists and is a big chance for social scientists. And second, we could see in the corona crisis that first, it's a big chance if policy recommendations by scientists uh, are picked up by uh, politicians and um, but this is not taking always um, the this is not uh, uh, taking place always so i would briefly bring uh, three dimensions uh, from my perspective and i will not only bring a perspective them from the perspective of statistics austria but from science and in particular from uh, political economy as well first of all the importance of scientific um, policy advice and evidence based policy and democracies and i do think think uh, that with a high probability, the pickup of scientific and evidence-based policy advice is in, a, in lots of cases a big chance and a gain for wealth growth and sustainability, actually. However, I will not talk about Austria, but in many countries, I can see that these recommendations are often not picked up. Up. In contrast, for instance, from some suggestions of special interest groups, this can cause, of course, suboptimal uh, results on a societal level as rent seeking is one of the driving forces for special interest groups. To achieve more awareness for um, academic policy advice or scientific policy recommendation, actually uh, scientists could um, go two ways. The one is to try to advise politicians directly and talk to them. And I'm sure that um, ministers like Martin Kocher are always open to such issue, but perhaps in some countries, not all. Yeah, And um, this is not always um, followed by big success, as of course in the political sphere, uh, power is the most valuable currency uh, and uh, not truth, whatever it is, or scientific advice. So the second uh, way to um, bring more awareness to um, scientific policy advice is go and inform the broader public, for instance, over the media, and with this to inform the voters actually about uh, evidence, um, about evidence, about facts, about results, and research findings. However, I did a lot of my academic research on uh, media analysis and the share of scientists in the classical media are often ranging around 2% of all quotes. With this, they are rather below the awareness threshold, and so uh, they don't have real impact when it comes to the broader public. We have to be here very clear on this issue. Um, the second point, the, the further point is that uh, in the age of social media and internet, uh, we have now the situation that everyone can spread news at marginal costs of zero, of zero. This is, of course, on one hand, a big contribution to informational freedom for individuals and, of course, a big chance for sharing information. But, of course, on the other hand, it is a big risk that uh, fake news and alternative facts are spread as well. So from my perspective, it would be absolutely needed that despite the fact that some scientists are rather often in the media, much more efforts should be invested there. Second, the importance of independent national statistical institutions in democracy. Okay, now speaking the head of statistical Austria, Statistics Austria, of course. Okay, uh, we have now, of course, uh, many, many, an increasing number of data owners and data sources today in course of uh, the uh, data revolution uh, President Ignafi have mentioned today. Uh, however, uh, even in this very complex and um, 
landscape with a rising complex in data, the NSIs, the National Statistical Institutes, still play an important role. What is very important is that they are independent, actually, from the government. I can give you an uh, example how useless dependent statistical institutions are. See the experience historically from the GDR, so the German dem so-called Democratic Republic in the east of Germany. Those, they were existing very, very fancy five years production plans, and they were always overperformed, and this was proved by the statistics of the GDR. However, in the same time, there were long queues in front of the supermarkets, and it was, in many, many cases, a lack of supply of demand. In the end, history did show that even dependent statistics cannot rescue such an uh, autoric uh, system on a long time. Last and third point, the gain of collaboration of social science and independent NSIs for society. Um, we have more and more data owners, but as mentioned, the National Statistical Institutes are still a central player. Um, however, I would say they are not only central player in this landscape with many, many data stored. They have the capacity, especially to assure data quality, data protection, and data security. As, for instance, we Statistics Austria is member of the European statistical system with quality checks, uh, with a code of practice, and with peer reviews by other colleagues of countries in a frequent time. Next year, it will take place again in Austria, by the way. And from my perspective, combining these capacities of the NSIs with the analytical skills of social science, the best evidence-based uh, policy uh, or advices can be achieved, actually. And therefore, we at Statistics Austria, we would love to set up already next year an Austrian microdata center with a broad access to microdata for universities and for other research institutions, and not only to the microdata which we own at Statistics Austria, but to the microdata of other public institutions as well. However, precondition for this is a reform of the federal statistical law, and which allows us legally to do such a thing. And I hope very much that this reform will take place and will pass the parliament very soon. Thank you very much. I cross my fingers, particularly on the last point that you made. We're all waiting for this uh, for this uh, legal um, text to be published. Um, brings me to uh, our last, not least, uh, contributor today, uh, Thomas Starlinger, currently the security advisor to the federal president, Alexander Van der Bellen. Uh, Thomas is a high-ranking officer in the Austrian Armed Forces, but also for more than one year, you have been organizing the uh, Future Operations Clearing Board, an informal platform enabling the exchange between scientists and public administration. While it was, I think, on the verge of the upcoming pandemic uh, that you created single-handedly, basically, this, uh, this board, I think your idea was to establish something that Barbara already mentioned, something longer lasting. Um, so please uh, share your thoughts with us. Thanks a lot for the invitation and uh, uh, nice regards uh, to you, Martin, to Brussels. Uh, he was also a member of uh, the clearing board of the Future Operations Platform, so it's a good basis for, for becoming minister, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, just some words on the, on the Future Operations Platform. Uh, it consists uh, of about more than 100 uh, scientists, uh, including almost all the universities in, in Austria, uh, of course, with, with also links to, to uh, universities in, abroad. Uh, there are five groups working. One, of course, uh, I don't have to mention it, it's a data group, uh, already in a very close link uh, with the Statistic Austria, also in terms of setting up the Austrian Micro Data Center. Uh, the four other groups, uh, of course, uh, due to the pandemic, uh, it's a health group, uh, it's a group on uh, strategic logistics, uh, third one working on labor market and ecological economics, uh, and last but not least uh, on society and psychology. psychology. Um, the, the strength of this platform is uh, an interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary spirit. Uh, so one of the, let's say, 
uh, last papers which came out uh, is dealing with uh, testing and open schools, uh, looking uh, at the autumn winter season uh, this year. And um, the, the experience I made, and it was, I think it was you, Thomas, uh, who provided uh, one, one of you, uh, provided me two articles uh, in The Guardian of uh, 2013. And it's very much reflecting when we talk about evidence-based uh, scientific advice, at first we have to ask the question, uh, who is dealing with whom? So in those two articles, uh, one had the topic, uh, top 20 things politicians need to know about science. Mm -hmm. And one week later, there was another article, top 20 things scientists need to know about policy making. I think uh, definitely there will be some discussions around and uh, Martin picked already two points out of them and I will just uh, elaborate a little bit on, on two of them. So it's uh, the first one is policy and science operate on different time scales. So on the one side, policymakers say they need, when they say they need information soon, they mean within days or weeks, not months. And in some cases, they even have already the press conference on the next day in their mind. Uh, on the other, and that's an important issue because if scientists wants to engage uh, with politicians, they have to keep that in mind. Of course, uh, if they want, if if you provide uh, sound uh, scientific mm -hmm. advice, it's not possible within 24 hours. How the uh, future operations platform dealt with them, there are two issues. On the one side. Of course, we tried to look a little bit to the crystal ball and say which kind of information might be needed within the next weeks and then start it. And that's, I would say in Austrian, we have the, 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 the sentence uh, to jump across your own shadow. And that was very much the, the scientists uh, uh, had to do to jump across their own shadow in terms of producing within two or three weeks a paper like uh, the use of uh, the mouse nose uh, protection or currently paper, it was already mentioned, uh, is dealing how to improve uh, the vaccination rate. Uh, and as I said, it's really a challenge on the one side for the scientists. On the other side, uh, there is an iterative process between the platform and the political level in terms of uh, what are the mid-term to long-term requirements. In term, timely spoken, it's what's required within the next four, six months. And it's some kind of teasing. So scientists seeing the political level in terms of, isn't that the question you would like to be answered? Uh, and also the others on, on the other side, that you in teasing the pol political level, you get also some, some questions you can elaborate on, on, on this one. Uh, and the other point is uh, uh, policymakers are not a homogeneous group. So it's not the policymakers. Uh, when we have a look to them, uh, I would even extend it when we look at the ministry. Of course, on the top of the ministry, you have the politicians, but let's say in the shadow of them, uh, you have already the administrative level. So in providing scientific advice, it's not good enough just to provide it to the political level. You have to keep in mind uh, there is a whole administration and you have uh, people sitting there, let's say already being 10 years in their own function and they would look at a scientific advisor, why do I need that? Um, and, and one of the, of the most important things, I, I would say the, uh, in our group, there is a, a running, not joke, but a running statement in terms of uh, COVID-19 did not create new trends, but definitely uh, accelerating trends in a, in a positive, and of course also in negative areas. And in a positive way, I think, uh, and that should already be the, the end of my, of my statement, is uh, that uh, the topic of providing scientific advice became really now a topic. And also in the, in the minds of the politicians, I look a little bit to Martin, uh, uh, it's also ex uh, not only accepted, it's, uh, it's expected on the one side. On the other side, uh, there is, of course, a, a huge responsibility on the scientific side. Because what we could see at the very beginning of the, of the crisis, there were single scientists providing their scientific advice. Uh, and then there was another one who also provided his or her scientific advice. And it was like 180 degrees uh, apart from each other. So that's also a point uh, which 
which has to be considered in, in talking about evidence-based uh, policy making. Thank you. Um, I think one of the most important things why I like that you are here, Thomas, today is also that we should not only concentrate on the issue of data, but also about uh, the fora where the exchange can happen between scientists and policymakers. I think uh, what you established, as I said, single entity, mostly single entity, I think it's fair to say single entity. Uh, with the Future Operations Board um, is uh, one of these instances where this uh, exchange can actually happen. And it's an, it, for me also participating a little bit in it is exciting, an exciting um, uh, exercise also to see the learning on both sides, the scientists and the policymakers um, with, this, uh, with this new forum. Um, it is now 10 minutes before Martin has to leave us, so I, I, I would like to take the chance for the second round to get back to you immediately. And Martin, is there something that you want to um, comment on, on what the, the colleagues uh, on the panel said so far? Otherwise, I also have a question for you, but I would like to ask you first, um, if there is something that you would like to comment on or question? Uh, I, I can be very brief. I mean, lots of the things have been said. I don't have to uh, I don't have to repeat things, uh, and I agree with most of what has been said. I mean, one of the things that I think we often underestimate, and, and Thomas reminded me of uh, of that, um, and he has, of course, the experience as a politician as well, uh, as a minister as well, uh, for uh, uh, more than a half a year, almost a year, um, that you should not underestimate the role of the administration, actually, because it's mainly not, I mean, of course, uh, as a minister, you sometimes talk to scientists directly. Uh, usually the form you get advice is uh, what we call whispering in the ear of princess or in the ear of prince. So you, you, you talk to people and try to understand. But formal advice giving, formal evidence-based policy making usually runs through top officials uh, in the administration. And I think uh, they have also different incentives and different uh, uh, interests. Um, and that's that has to be kept in mind. And exchange between the administration and science is extremely important. And I guess there's lots of room for improvement in Austria on that on that level. Thomas, do you want to pick up on this? Uh, since uh, Martin rightly mentioned that you have been a minister. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I make it really short. I, I just can agree, uh, Martin. I, I think uh, it's uh, as important uh, to convince uh, a high uh, administrative official uh, and, uh, and and the minister. I think that's almost the same challenges. And what what I've said before, the change of mindset. Of course, it's also required uh, on the on the higher administration because they are not used uh, to to get si outside scientific advice for their advices to their own minister. Okay, thank you. Uh, Martin, I still would like to follow up uh, with, with the one question and I would then also address it to the, the others. But um, to start with you, um, can you give us um, from the past, I think now it's uh, almost, it's, it's almost five months that you're a minister now, um, if, in your experience, what have been the biggest hurdles in uh, listening to scientific, um, uh, to, to science advice um, when you make uh, when you make decisions? And uh, what is your experience? How much room and how much time is there actually in the daily uh, routine um, of uh, being a high-level uh, policymaker um, in a country like Austria? So it depends a bit on uh, uh, on what kind of decisions you focus on. Of course, there is, uh, and I guess most ministries have that uh, some body uh, that advise you on a continuous level. So at the Ministry of Labour, uh, we have a, a standing uh, committee uh, where uh, some institutes are represented, and uh, we have regular meetings also with. Uh, uh, high-level uh, administrators uh, in the ministry, uh, and uh, uh, they provide uh, evidence and some advice on uh, on on pressing topics that change over time. But uh, uh, that's a typical thing that uh, uh, that I think most ministries have uh, in one way or the other. Then there are sometimes um, sometimes uh, bodies or institutions that are formalized. Uh, we have uh, a new one uh, where we um, uh, want to discuss uh, the future of work uh, with a 
very diverse uh, uh, number of people from science, but also from uh, from practice. Um, and that's something that I think most ministries have as well, that you have some topics that know oh, it's long-term perspective uh, and you want to get advice and want to get feedback and want to uh, uh, run some policies by these people uh, uh, in the long run. Uh, the most, I think, um, uh, the most um, uh, demanding uh, advice and policy, uh, uh, evidence-based policy making is when it comes to specific reforms, um, specific reforms that you want to um, build on, uh, on scientific advice, because reforms follow uh, a political logic and a scientific logic. Uh, the scientific logic is clear, there's evidence, and people look at the evidence, compare the evidence, and there's, uh, uh, there is some conclusion on what you should do in terms of how institutions should be built or how laws should be changed. But there's, of course, also a political, uh, um, uh, a political side to it. Um, even the best advice uh, doesn't help you, even if it's perfectly evidence-based, if, for instance, and uh, I'm not pointing at any uh, real decision at the moment, but this is something that could happen, of course, um, that the, the advice that uh, would not go well with your coalition partner. Uh, and of course, if you, of course, then have somebody who gives you that advice, uh, that would even make it more difficult to find a political compromise. So you have to keep these two things in mind, the, uh, the political influences and the uh, the science influences, uh, and sometimes they might oppose each other, sometimes timing might be crucial, and um, strategically organizing the process in a way that this works out well is really demanding for both sides, I guess, uh, and that will always be demanding um, because uh, it's not nothing where you can use a blueprint and just build on it. Thank you, thank you. Um, does any one of you want to pick up there um, with your personal experiences? Uh, Thomas, you've been a minister, as I said. Baba, you've been uh, in different advisory boards in different levels, European level, also in Britain, I think, also in Austria, of course, um, with Thomas as well, of course. Um, please. Um, and in the meantime, while you think maybe um, if anyone in the audience uh, wants to raise a question um, to the Analysts, then uh, please prepare and um, then look whether someone has a question. So I think the, the the emphasis on the importance of administration is a very important one. Um, another important one, which was also raised by Thomas, is um, the time scale. So of course I had to laugh because. Um, I often get very angry, you know, when I get an invitation from. Thomas mentioned that I'm also in some advisory boards and I get an invitation um, whether I can attend a meeting in two weeks' time. I can't attend a meeting in two weeks' time somewhere in another city because I have to teach or whatever. So academics have different time scales. But I think um, what, what we need if we want to in, improve this interface between science and policymaking, and of course, I think we should have a discussion what that would look like ideally, you know, with independence of science and also with 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 good policy making, but that, that's a different conversation. So what we need is we have to have fast and slow science that that um, underpins and caters to policy making. I think one of the risks when we emphasize the fast paced production a bit too much is that um, the reward and incentive systems move very, very fast towards rapid science. Um, so in a way, I speak from my own experience, and I have loved the academic system in the UK, but one problem was that with research assessments and also with the, the fact that actually scientific impact, uh, sorry, social impact in the UK was worth money for the university. So the incentive structures changed. And everything had to be very, very fast. You couldn't say anymore, um, okay, I'm going to do this experiment and three years from now, it might, I might know whether it works or not, or I'm going to write, I'm going to be really quiet and walk on my, you know, alpine 
um, a second home, whatever, or I'm going to teach like Wittgenstein did in a school and three years from now, I'm going to write a book. You can't do that anymore. So what happens as a result is that everything becomes assessed and audited at a very um, um, small scale and in a fast paced way. And people do no longer have time and opportunity for blue sky thinking in the sense that you ask the big questions. So having said that, we need to retain that. At the same time, I think in Austria, we are at the other extreme. So when I came back to Austria after a long time in the UK, I loved, you know, I did a lot of policy work. I was very proud of it. Some of my colleagues thought it was really a dirty job because that's low stuff. You're supposed to write papers and you're supposed to only write when it comes out in a peer-reviewed journal. So, and I think Thomas said that, you Thomas, so there you see that I'm struggling here with everyone having Thomas in his name. <laughs> Thank you, Martin. <laughs> so, so um, I mean, Thomas, you have done, you have really done a wonderful job by creating an environment um, where, where you actually, I think because you're just a nice and charming person, got people to write papers very fast, yet not feel that they are giving up their identity. And we need more of that. We also need incentives and reward systems where academics and especially junior academics who don't have permanent jobs yet, they don't feel that this is just another task to be dumped upon them on top of their already 60 hours work week, but it needs to be something that is given training, that is given time. And if somebody loves to do policy work, they should be given time and, and you know, um, um, affirmation and rewards, and it needs to go into that time allocation. So it can't be something that is just on top of everything else for the junior ones. For the senior ones, I think it's part of what the role of a senior academic should be. But again, this is a plea for emphasizing fast and also slow interaction with policymaking. Thank you. Well, I couldn't agree more, actually, and thank you for pointing on this timing issue. Actually, uh, I would always say uh, that uh, both uh, should be done by a real scientist, whatever it is. Uh, for instance, long-term basic research and applied things uh, to political practice. Perhaps there can be a little bit a split of competencies and most focus, but actually I can remember quite well, there was a discussion in Germany uh, when uh, in, at University of Cologne, some uh, new professors uh, should uh, should be hired yes and there was a discussion it was an economics department should be more higher professors who are uh, applied ones and give give policy advice uh, to institutions politicians ministries and so on or should we hire some with a great publication record in international peer reviewed journals and so on and there were at least some guys who said nine it's not possible to do both and so opted for one or the other and especially uh, the ones who are, w did work in applied science, I have to say, did shout loud that if they do basic research, no time anymore for, uh, the, uh, for, the, for, the, for the applied science. However, uh, some rankings like the Economist ranking in several countries, and here Martin Kocher as a person did the proof already that it's possible to do high class basic research and to applied research as well. And I see institutions like IHS and VIFO in this line actually, and so I would say don't do the one without uh, completely the other, uh, because then uh, we are touching either uh, that uh, science is not anymore relevant for the political practice or we are not scientists anymore and do alchemy, actually. And this is something what not should take place. I would one small word, perhaps in addition to the question of uh, administration uh, below uh, the minister, that's true. But please keep in mind, or even there, there can be incentives and utility functions as Niskan did teach us that bureaucracy can have its own agenda as well, uh, like it is for lobbies with Olsen or uh, for politicians, of course. Thank you, and also thank you, thank you for... Uh, yeah. You have to drop out, so I'm sorry. You have thank to leave, right? Thanks okay, so thank you again, Martin, for participating, and uh, see you soon. Here, have a nice um, uh, See you soon. Bye-bye. Okay. Um, thank you also for uh, highlighting the role of VIFO and EHS. I can tell you from, da from the daily practice in, in one of these institutes, it's, uh, it's a daily competition to bring these two uh, things under one roof, uh, the side and the academic side. But um, 
that we try. Uh, Thomas, do you want to add something? I have a practical example on that what Martin uh, was mentioning uh, in terms of uh, the scientific evidence and the political constraints and restraints. Uh, and I, everyone of, in, in this room has already been, been uh, uh, involved in this issue. It's a duration of the tests, of the different tests. Why an antigen test uh, is valid for 48 hours, a PCR test uh, at the beginning also for 48 hours and so on. There's a clear scientific advice. Uh, I could take uh, the graphs of the Robert Koch Institute. It clearly tells you uh, antigen test maximum 12 hours. If you move towards 24 hours, you're already quite risky. PCR test is about 72 hours. So the first uh, uh, legal framework was telling us 48 hours for both tests. The correct, why is that? So now it comes to the political constraints and restraints. The, the only city at this time or, or province which was able uh, to run PCR tests was Vienna. All the other provinces did not have the opportunity of running these PCR tests. They only had the antigen tests. So it was quite clear that the governors of the eight other provinces were demanding no way to have only an antigen test, only with a duration of 12 hours. And it became even worse uh, with the self antigen tests uh, in front of the nose, uh, which has a validity of, uh, let's say, one hour if they detect the right people. But you also have it in this framework. And it shows this example, and you can apply that to also to, to many other fields, uh, is exactly. Uh, presenting uh, this distinction between uh, the best uh, scientific uh, evidence, but also the political constraints and restraints. And it's also, uh, and specifically, and we, which, which just could follow this issue during the last weekend, the discussion between the prime minister and the minister of health. Uh, and it was, at the end, was surprising for everyone. So the, <laughs> <laughs> yes, stop. Yeah, yeah, better stop. <laughs> and, the other, <laughs> and the other point Barbara was mentioning, uh, the, the platform, of course, not to get into this uh, fast or uh, speed speed science, uh, is now a, a racing corporation uh, with the, uh, um, in English it would be the Council of uh, Research and uh, and Technolo Technological Development uh, there. Rat für Forschungs- und Technologieentwicklung. And uh, that's the next step for the platform to concentrate on mid to, to long term uh, projects on the one side, uh, but also related to funding, uh, because I have to mention all the, uh, the scientists and also institutions. So it's not just the scientists from different universities, also EIS, uh, uh, VFO, WWTF, uh, and so on. All those institutions are also involved uh, in. In terms of these cooperations with the IFT, uh, there will be also this funding and the more mid to long term uh, focus uh, guarantee. So we will have both uh, the fast uh, and the slow science, as you mentioned. Thank you. That was a brilliant example and also great to hear it from you as you are from this advantageous position from the presidency, sitting somewhat above these uh, different ministries and the chancellery than having this uh, interesting development. Um, we have two uh, questions or comments from the auditorium. And I think it works the way that you tell me your question, and then I will have to repeat it again so that the audience in the virtual room can hear it as well, if I understand correctly. Sorry? Um, I, I, or, or you come up here. That, that, yes, you could, you could get, go to the lecture, and then you can uh, ask your question. That's probably the best way to do it. Um, Susanne, I saw you first, so. Okay. Um, yeah, I was actually just drawing circles with different agents while listening to you. And so somehow it seems that we, you have agreed that there are players that are scientists. There are players called policymakers. We have collectively in the, in the discussion or while listening, um, reclaimed the public administration as important players in this process too. And I was wondering, 
So I'm missing a bit the emphasis on the general public, the people, okay? In two, in two dimensions, actually, in several dimensions. One is, how do you think, first of all, about what, what is a good feedback mechanism between, let's say, scientists and the general public who are, in the end, the people we want to inform or find out something for, because we are part of them as well? And what would be a good information flow? How do you think about um, open science movements in that direction or in that in that context? Because that's something that is coming up. I mean, I'm hearing that on the radio a lot. And in particular, if you think about what uh, Frau Preinzak, um mentioned or brought up, the process of datification and that you actually create reality by the questions you ask and by the type of data you collect, and whether that should not be more, more, let's say, an open uh, participatory process. Well, I don't know the answer because I'm very skeptical myself. I don't know. I don't know how to deal with this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Susanne. Um, who wants to start? Uh, yeah. It's a short word. So thank you. Uh, this was actually what I, I tried to say that and in the end, uh, if you want to uh, solve the problem of different uh, utility functions, uh, if so, uh, if existing, uh, between politicians interested in the probability of being elected next time and perhaps a longer lasting development uh, of, of, a, of a country, uh, then from my perspective, uh, the chances to um, give uh, effective a policy advice by that only by only directly talking to politicians and uh, the administration is of uh, limited um, yeah of, of limited success uh, but however if you start uh, to inform the broader public and convince the median voter uh, then poli politicians will have a very high interest probably to follow this advice and so I think not only because of transparency issues which are underlying as well, but uh, about the 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 uh, the power and the success probabilities of scientific policy advice, uh, the uh, the voter, the broader public should not skip out. Actually, um, how the feedback uh, loop can be there, I'm not so sure. Perhaps my colleagues have some uh, some ideas there. I support open science uh, uh, movements and so on. However, it has to come that, of course, the the findings are translated into under, into understandable language in not formal way and of course in the tongue of the country where the story takes place uh, uh, not even english is understood from uh, every person also so these are the it's a hard work and sometimes from a scientist's perspective, uh, perhaps not the most uh, pleasurable, uh, perhaps, uh, but it uh, has to be done. Uh, otherwise, uh, um, the findings are under risk to be not recognized. So um, I'm, I'm not going to give you the cheap answer to say it's very important. Um, because the, the million dollar question is, of course, how to do that. And I'm going to now go to open science for a moment because um, openness is not an end in itself. So for those of us who have followed the um, debates about um, the open source um, um, availability of, um, of uh, SARS-CoV-2 sequences, where African researchers said, we're actually against that. We're against that because the cu current system, which is not open, um, requires that the, the people who use sequence information to credit the depositing sci scientists. And they said, well, we're working at night because during the day we've got no electricity. We work our butts off, excuse the French, and then we're going to deposit it and then everyone else in the West is going to use it. So openness sometimes as a political program, it's almost sometimes dangerous because it's a little bit like medieval gallantry where, you know, you kiss the hand of the lady to cover up the, dis the inequalities between the genders. So actually, I don't know whether they kissed the hand in, in medieval times, but gallantry originated then. So openness is, can be very dangerous if it becomes a programmatic thing that can conceal inequalities rather than address them. So we need to always ask what underpins openness. 
the other examples, you know, with um, the uh, Open Data Initiative um, has, or, or the Freedom of Information Act, which in some countries is be interpreted very widely, led to the fact that um, sometimes when people are asked to write a reference for someone, you write a wonderful reference and then say, call me if you've got questions. So then there's this whole shadow system of saying, no, don't hire him, he's really difficult, you know? So it creates shadow structures as well. Um, so I think engaging the public, we need always, or publics, it's really publics now. We need to ask how we can meaningfully do that. And at the moment with regard to COVID, I think th the biggest challenge is to really listen to wider audiences and not engage, 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 but actually listen to people with disabilities, people, um, homeless people, and so on and so on. Um, and also to, to, to um, consider the effects of certain policies on, on communities that might be marginalized, underserved, and frontline communities, and also engage with those people when it comes to the implementations of certain decisions. Some things that we learned in our study, in, in one of our two COVID studies, is that a lot of people felt very alone with implementing decisions. They didn't necessarily criticize the decisions. They said, I have no idea how to do that, and I'm not getting any. So we, we should really consider that question on a case-by-case -case basis, rather than jumping to very large programs of openness that might have more negative consequences in some situations, then, then they solve problems. Uh, one one short, small point, short, please, small please, one, one small point uh, to this, uh, because you did ask a question about uh, which research questions are worked on and how can be a process started that perhaps the focus is not only on one issue and or the other. Uh, I want to give one more example uh, from uh, Germany, where I come from, you can hear it actually. Um, that is uh, that uh, those, uh, uh, they are the institutes, big uh, economic uh, research institutes and some others, uh, they are finance and so by the, mostly by the so-called Leibniz Society, yes? So it is somehow a public funding, but it's not funded directly by the ministries. So the Leibniz community is between the ministries, if you want, or between the public budgets and the research institutes. And this gives lots of space, actually, for the research institutes to focus on all topics which they think are interesting to research on. Of course, one third about the financing is by direct contracts as well, and so on. And each few years, Leibniz uh, Society does evaluation if the research was, uh, of course, highly published, uh, but relevant as well. But beside this, we had very, very good experiences in Germany with this system. And I know that uh, at least some scientists and some institutes uh, wish such system in Australia as well. Um, I, I come back to your question, because why did we not mention uh, the, the public opinion? Um, I had it even on, on, on my paper. Uh, of course, uh, public opinion heavily influences the political decision-making process. But as, as, <laughs> as I mentioned before, that policymakers are not the homogeneous group, also public is not the homogeneous group. And one mistake, I say it very provocatively, when we discuss in this kind of, uh, of people, we are not repress, representing the majority of the Austrian population. Full stop. Uh, the majority of the Austrian population might even not be interested in the topics we are discussing. Uh, how to reach the majority of the Austrian population? We are not watching uh, the TIP2 discussions uh, or, or TV, how, how to reach them via social media. I mean, there's a very good example. There's a, one of the scientists, I forgot his name, in very simple terms, he's always explaining uh, with vegetables how the, uh, uh, the, uh, the virus is working. Maybe yeah. he's, he's, he's taking uh, uh, vegetables and say, this is the, the virus and how it comes into the, the cells and so on. Uh, so even you don't you're not aware of them, of them. That would be a very uh, easy way to, to approach them. And, and there is another issue. When we talk about public, 
uh, I look at the at the parliament. We have different parties in it, having complete different political ag agendas. So even if you are if you have a government who honestly would uh, like to provide information to the public, there would be immediately the opposition in the parliament uh, opposing it uh, with with arguments, and you can see it. And here we are. I mentioned at the beginning uh, this uh, responsibility in, in the scientific world. Uh, if you provide an advice, uh, it should not be your 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 own opinion. Uh, and uh, come back to the beginning of the crisis uh, when we when you've and, and it's still now, uh, you have people who say this virus is not existing and people, also scientists, saying it's not existing. So coming back to the public, what should I do? Uh, I have no, and I, in this group on, on, on the platform, I always say, uh, I have the, 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 the lowest level of, of, of scientific knowledge. So I'm not a scientist. And uh, let's say, uh, if I compare my knowledge now with the public, I, <laughs> I take this term. Uh, I think that's the main uh, main issue: how to bring not only the scientific evidence-based advice to the politicians, to the high administration. It's how to, to bring it to a broad public that they can understand uh, at the end the decisions which are made on the political level. And there is, I don't have an answer. It's also a billion-dollar uh, question. <laughs> yes. A second question from the audience, please. Uh, so just building on this this idea of, of actors and who is uh, who needs uh, evidence, I would like to uh, challenge a little bit this uh, the the panel. And you talked a lot about high level policymakers, politicians, bureaucrats. And if you look at, for example, the literature on policy implementation, you actually. Uh, quickly come to the conclusion that what really matters for policy outcomes is those who implement policies, the doctors and, and teachers. And I have a certain tendency, and it you know, also applies to me, is that it's a fancy thing to provide advice to a politician, to a minister, right? I mean, I can pride myself, but actually how uh, fancy it is, how prized it is among uh, those who produce evidence to give advice to ordinary teachers, ordinary doctors and do we have the systems and I think maybe Barbara you have an interesting uh, feedback on this from from the UK's perspective which is very good in translating evidence to the practice for GPs to doctors you know it's not about you know the high level evidence but creating the systems and the incentive structures for translating evidence to those who need it to implement policies so I think we'd be very happy to hear your views on on this aspect of evidence based policy making on the front lines on those for those who implement policies. Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant question. Also to bring this to the ground a little bit. Uh, who wants to start? Yes. I think this is actually not the task of scientists, unless you are an implementation scholar. So your policy scholar focusing on implementation, yes, then yes. I mean, I totally agree with your, with your diagnosis, but I don't think that scientists um, are necessarily the main group and academics that should spend their time translating policy into um, into protocols, clinical protocols, and so on and so on. With 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 regard to the UK, I would say they are overscripted, right? And you you can't take a school class out to get ice cream anymore without doing a risk analysis two weeks before so they're overscripted but but I, I take your point and they are good at the i think me, what what i experienced in the uk is that there's less of a disdain for the concrete and the empirical there's more of a disdain of this here but i don't think that this is necessarily the role the role of academics um however and coming back to your question i think implementation and administration in the broader sense, not only public administration, but the implementation of policies, of public and other policies, is something where there's a huge amount to be done in terms, in terms of participation. For example, now that we are re in reinventing so many things in the pandemic, for a lot of problems, there are solutions, but nobody sees them because nobody dares to look. Because people in a village have a solution for you know, a couple that has 
is recovering slowly, can't cook for themselves, so the neighborhood cooks. Or other solutions, sometimes technical solutions. Nobody looks. So what happens, either those citizens who have good ideas, they create a Verein, and then the Verein sometimes, the association doesn't get any financial instruments, so they, they stop doing it, or somebody else buys them to you know, to weed out the competition or to scale it commercially. So there's a real opportunity, I think, for, for also for, for the state to foster participation and to look at how citizens can help implement good ideas, not only implement, but also create good ideas that then with the help of public authorities can be scaled. I think we're not doing well on that. To um, follow up with this, and I agree with uh, Barbara that uh, this is um, not the main job of scientists, actually. Uh, however, I uh, have, have been attending lots of such kind of discussions, and sooner or later we're coming to the case of bashing the educational uh, system and the media. And don't understand me wrong, because I'm a big supporter of both, and I see I think that both are wirklich essential in 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 in, in democracies. Uh, so if not scientists can improve the uh, education at the schools, however, perhaps there should be in parts. I do know that lots of things developed since I went to school, but I think there's still some uh, space for improvement uh, when it comes to statistical literacy, for instance, or to, to somehow to enable uh, the pupils uh, to understand in the, in the media and social media world uh, what are more probable uh, fake news and, and what are facts. And uh, this leads me directly to the media uh, question, uh, because this was pointing a little bit by Thomas uh, Stalinger, and he said, now yeah, uh, when one scientist said this, then uh, another party in parliament is quoting another. And that is actually something I, I uh, did observe empirically and uh, in, by my own experience uh, rather often, because me as an economist, often friends came to me or my family and said, ah yeah, you have always here so splitting opinions within economics, 50% say this and 50% they say that. And I was always wondering uh, how, uh, how they come to this idea. Because when I go to the uh, uh, big um, uh, conferences of the German um, uh, Economic Association Verein für Sozialpolitik with uh, 3.5 thousand uh, members, actually, I have the experience to the big questions, actually, not in detail, but big questions uh, that we have here, majority opinion on many, many issues by about 80%. How does it come that then my grandmother thinks it's 50-50? And I can tell you why it is. It is in parts because of the media who are making a story. Yes, two scientists are talking to each other and they take one out of the 80% majority and then place one out of the 20% minority uh, the, without saying that these uh, proportions are there. And the impression uh, by my grandmother is then, ah, it's clear, you are against split 50-50. This is a mechanism. I think and that was one of the, of the lessons identified and also learned on the political decision-making level. So at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, you even had this 50-50 uh, issue. In the meantime, uh, they got used uh, to, to look at an, an scientific advice and ask questions like, uh, was there a peer review? Uh, is there a multi or interdisciplinary approach and so on? I think that was one of the, of the learnings uh, of, of the past uh, 14 months. Um, on the other side, you never will, will be able to avoid uh, that an opposing party in the parliament uh, is taking the leave uh, the remaining 2% of the scientific <laughs> say, this is uh, uh, the position. Uh, but definitely there is also responsibility uh, within the media, no doubt. Uh, you have, let's say, serious medias, which uh, definitely will be able to differ. And you have media, uh, which are consumed by a majority of the people, uh, which have obviously other, uh, let's say, uh, direction and guidance uh, from, from the owners. Well, um, it's close to half past six, uh, and uh, we are actually um, running out of time now. Um, 
think there are a lot of questions still open about evidence-based policy making and how to make sure that it is happening and what the premises are, the prerequisites are to do it. Um, but one thing I feel very confident about is that I did not promise you too much, but this was a superior panel um, with very different and still very um, insightful comments and statements. I would like to thank you for coming. I would like to thank you in the room for attending. Um, I would like to thank everyone in the virtual room for attending and listening. Um, thank you for thank you to the organizers also for this uh, wonderful um, conference. Um, I think it was a starting point, um, and uh, maybe when the pandemic uh, has developed in a way that uh, we can gather in larger groups again, we can also um, come up with uh, an another event like this and then also play more tribute to the idea that this is also a networking event, which was the one of the initial ideas, not the only one, but one of the initial ideas. Um, so I would like to thank everyone. Um, have a very nice evening um, and uh, see you soon, hopefully.